we are on to our last video, which is from Frank Turek. Now, some of you may know that I recently spoke with Frank Turek on the Unbelievable Show. It was both a good conversation, but also a bit of a frustrating one. I felt like the moderator pulled me off a few times and we didn't quite get into some of the heart of where I could really explore what Frank had to say. But a weird phenomenon that's happened this summer is that several of the apologetics communities have actually figured out how to use social media. Frank Turek has been trying all kinds of things, and I've been watching him try these little short videos, a couple minutes long, even with like a 15 second clip of what's actually going to happen like a minute later. It's a little bit weird, but man, his team has nailed it because they figured out a way to harness TikTok and shorts because Frank says a lot of things that are rhetorical sound bites and they're meant to sound incredibly pithy and powerful if you don't think about it anymore. If you listen to it, you think, wow, and then your thumb flips up and you're on to the next video. Frank is now regularly getting millions of views on his YouTube shorts on topics that we normally cover. Anyway, this one is his latest great hit to cover another thing that I'm normally frustrated with Frank over. And if you know anything about my channel, Apology Alive is largely a place to vent my frustration, my Canadian anger, as it were. So let's hear what Frank has to say. Where do laws come from? Laws come from proven evidence over time that... No, the laws themselves. Okay. So this is presumably part of a larger question. But one of the things Frank does, he likes to conflate different usages and meanings of the word law. I believe that this student, he does a lot of speaking at campuses, so I'm just going to assume this is a student. When Frank says, where do laws come from? He's thinking human laws in society, legal laws. And he was attempting to put forth where legislators might pull to come up with their ideas for laws. Frank interrupts him and says, no, 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 not politicians. Where do laws come from? Where do they come from? Where do the where do laws of nature come from? Laws. Okay. So then actually you get to watch him shift. Although if I'm being fair to Frank, he actually did make a clarification shift that perhaps he's not going to conflate the way we understand legal laws with natural laws, the set of observations for which we have no exceptions or just documented exceptions that we know are exceptions. So we call it a natural law if ever we observe that no longer being the case, we will stop holding it as a law. That's all. In nature come from men who have definitively done the same experiments with scientific method. And no, 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 I, I don't mean. So that's not a bad answer. He's basically saying, yeah, men meaning humans, I'm assuming not males. They do experiments over and over again. They keep seeing the same results. So we call it a natural law. Not a bad answer on the spot. In us discovering the laws of nature, the laws themselves, the force of gravity, electromagnetism, the strong and weak nuclear forces. Why are they there? Why are they there? This is another example of asking an ontological question where perhaps it is inappropriate. There may not be a why. This may well be a what does purple smell like or nonsense questions. There might be a why, but there may well just be the answer that because matter and energy exist and have always existed in whatever sense we can talk about time outside of our instantiation of space-time. We don't really know what that looks like, so that's why we use the word eternal often instead of infinity. If matter and energy are eternal in some sense, and they have properties, it just makes sense that they would have some kind of property. Everything that exists has properties, so these are some of the ones for something that exists, Frank. I, I dispute your need for a why. Why are they so persistent and consistent? I don't know. So consistent and persistent, meaning, you know, I think why do we wake up tomorrow when the laws of physics are the same as they were yesterday and they will be, we presume that they will be the same tomorrow. This is the weird thing I don't quite get about Christians is what do they think the universe would look like if there was no God? Do they think that things wouldn't have properties that stayed the same? In a Christian worldview, that is where you have an entity that can come in and potentially change the properties of things to your own design as you go where a deity could potentially make the laws of physics different tomorrow than today if that's what they wanted. In a natural world without God, you would actually need an external force to change the laws of physics. You don't need an external force to keep them from changing. If you're ever in this kind of conversation with someone like Frank, ask, and I hope to someday again, have another conversation with him. What do you think the universe looks like with no God? Why do you anticipate that the laws of physics would change moment to moment? It's a weird, weird take. I'm saying that's the product of a mind. <laughs> laws come from lawgivers. And okay. So he thought maybe he wasn't going to conflate, but he went right back to it. Laws come from lawgivers. That 
is only true in a legal law sense, not in a natural law sense. So Frank just totally sent him into scientific laws and then pulled them back and is pulling a rope dope with legal laws, which we know are created by humans. We don't know of any legal laws that we're not. Sigh. The reason why the laws of nature are so consistent and precise is because this universe was put together and fine-tuned and sustained by a mind. That's just an assertion that it helps explain nothing. What prediction can we make about this universe that we know better because we assume that there's a mind holding it together? What piece of technology can we make based on assuming that a mind is holding it together that we can't already make with our presupposition that the universe is intelligible and consistent already? So that is a presupposition. We actually can't prove that using science. That's a presupposition with a small cost because that completely fits with everything we've ever observed. We've never observed the laws of physics changing. So it may well be a presupposition, but it has a small epistemological cost. Presuming that a God is holding it together is a huge epistemological cost because we don't know that the universe would fly apart without a mind. We have no data about this mind. We can't demonstrate the mind. So it's a huge additional leap. Again, Occam's razor. If you're looking for what's simplest, we don't need this mind to be holding the world together. We just know that energy has properties and that these are the properties and that's proof fact what they are. We can't do science if the laws of nature changed every 10 minutes. That's true. So I'm saying to get behind all this, there's a mind behind the universe. And that's why science makes sense. Well, science makes sense. You do not, Frank. As I, I think I laid it all the cards out already. We do not require positing a mind. The universe is intelligible. The, the laws of physics hold from day to day. And that they, there isn't just willy-nilly change. Again, Christians, tell me why a universe without a God would fall apart and why properties would be inconsistent. That makes no sense to me. Even when I was a Christian, it didn't make sense to me. So please help me understand, Frank, why you think this is a valid assumption, why you think that without a God, universal properties, natural laws would be changing day to day, minute to minute. I don't get it. I don't think Frank gets it. And that's my rant for the day. Appreciate you staying and hanging out with me to be Canadian angry.